Welcome to Dead Ball TV, everybody. Today's episode is going to be all about the Korean national team. I'm joined today by Jason Lee, and we got a bunch to talk about. Primarily, the news that broke earlier today regarding Jurgen Klinsmann, who has been sacked as manager of South Korea. I was going to ask you, Jason, um, if you thought this was a good idea, but I think that's too easy of a question. So I'm going to ask you a different one. Is there anybody that you know or you have seen who is upset at the decision? to fire Klinsman. Absolutely zero people <laughs> I know who is upset at the decision. He, you know, I think before the Asian Cup, there was a little bit of, you know, controversy as to some people wanted him to stay. They thought that he was a good man manager. Um, he helped grow the brand of Korean football because all, in all honesty, he is a big name. Um, if you say Jurgen Klinsman, if you're a football fan, more often than not, you are going to be familiar with the name. But after this Asian Cup, after everyone, you know, casual fans and fanatics alike, after we saw the abysmal performances that Korea was putting in, just the lack of ideas. And considering that this is, I personally think, our golden generation, um, absolutely nobody that I know of was upset that Klinsman <laughs> is now gone from the Korean national team. <laughs> Bro, I have not, I have not either seen a single person. And I was thinking, I can't remember a, a managerial sacking with probably a 99.9% .9 approval rating. Like, this has got to be one of the cleanest slates or landslide uh, decisions I've ever seen in, like, football Twitter, which is usually very tribal and everybody's disagreeing all the time. Not in the case of getting rid of Klinsman. Everyone's like, thank goodness. All right, who's next? And before I ask you who's next, just to play devil's advocate here a little bit, you know, for, uh, for our boy Klinsman, who did manage the U.S. and I guess did okay. Uh, the US men's national team. Do you think there's anything besides bringing clout to Korea that Klinsman did well? I'd have to really, really think <laughs> about that one. Like, I think he facilitated, I think he created an environment in Korea where it was, if you're playing in the K League, you're probably not going to make the national team unless you caught the eye of Chaduri, who was the, he's the son of Chabungun, who is a South Korean football legend, and he was the assistant manager to Klinsman. And basically, he did all the in-person scouting of the Kaylee. Like, this is one of the big reasons why a lot of Korean fans didn't like Klinsman was he didn't stay in Korea. He didn't scout our domestic league. And when we asked him about it, he said, I don't have to scout the domestic league. Um, I can watch the players play on Y Scout at home in California. Um, so I think there is a mentality, especially amongst the younger Korean players, where if you're in the K-League, you are most uh, likely not going to get on this Korean national team. So we saw a lot of young players move to Europe uh, during his stint as the national team manager. And personally, I think that is a big positive. Like I think, of course, the domestic league in any nation is super important as the foundation, as the pillar uh, for that nation to grow in terms of its football uh, ca capacity and capabilities. But... We all know the the different quality and the level in terms of infrastructure, um, the support, the resources that they have in Europe. And when young Korean players move abroad, I think that's only a plus. Um, it helps open the gate for future moves. And I think that was maybe one minor, minor, minor positive of Klinsman's uh, tenure in Korea, which he didn't even mean to do, which is, which is quite funny. Mm -hmm. An accidental positive. What's even funnier is that is something that a lot of U.S. fans would argue was also his greatest impact was the kind of prioritization of the foreign-born players. A little different in this case because th these Korean guys aren't necessarily foreign-born. They're just they're moving abroad. But like the fact that getting out of Korea or getting out of MLS kind of becoming a prerequisite for national team appearances, you could say in the cases of both national teams is a good thing, seeing as neither of them are like you know top five in the world. That is a good thing. It is kind of funny that you can connect that to Klinsman at both the U.S. and the Korean job. Um, what have you seen online and what is your personal opinion on who the next South Korean manager should be? There's a lot of actually like debate on that. I think so. The KFA spent a lot of money to sack Yuri Klinsman. I think it was like anywhere from five to ten million because they had to pay the rest of Jurgen Klinsman's contract off. But then he also it's crazy because at the Asian Cup, there were 35 um, staff, J 
just it could be coaches, it could be analysts, physio. It was the biggest um, in terms of sheer quantity. It was the biggest um, staff that we ever took to the Asian Cup, and we produced those um, very disappointing results. But we have to also not only pay off Klinsman, but we also have to pay off the rest of his assistant coaches, uh, his analysts, his physio, and that's going to cost a lot of money to the KFA. So right now, I think the Korean Football Association is looking is leaning towards domestic coaches, simply because they're um, less financially straining on the the KFA. And another tidbit that's interesting to know is the training center, the national training, the football national training center, where the Korean national team trains when whenever there's um, an, an international period. That used to be in Paju. Um, but now they totally scrapped that. The rent for the, the Paju National Training Center um, was, was um, the contract was over. And so they had to find a new place for the, the national team to train. And that's, gonna, um, that's already costing us so much money. Uh, we have to build it from scratch. And it's funny because leading up to the Asian Cup, like I'm laughing, but it's, it's a really sad situation. <laughs> The national team did not touch a football for two weeks, two to three weeks leading up to the Asian Cup. Everything was fitness based in a hotel in Seoul. So hold on, hold on, hold on. You're telling me it's utterly, it's utterly ridiculous. There wasn't like a university nearby. I've seen the schools in Seoul. I know there's quite a few of them. We, you couldn't if they didn't have that in the budget, couldn't have rented a field. There are, but either it, it wasn't in the budget, or I think they're just in, uh, they're incompetent. And okay, let's say they're there. It wasn't in the budget, and they're incompetent. Then the manager's role is to push the football federation to you know rent any sort of field for the players to practice in. But Klinsman apparently said, "No, this is enough. Fitness is enough. We'll get to Qatar and we'll train there." So we lost two to three weeks worth of training where you could build team wow. chemistry, you could improve on whatever tactics you have. But yeah, that's a that's a separate tangent. But that just shows how limited we are in terms of finances. Where maybe we can't even rent, you know, um, a nice field for two to three weeks. Um, so I think we are leaning towards domestic managers. There's a bunch of names that have been mentioned. Uh, Hong Myungbo, I think, is the leading candidate. He was the former national team manager uh, for Korea at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. He didn't do well there, but he won back-to-back -back, uh, K-League titles with Ulsan. He's a very well-respected member as the, the captain, I think, of the 2002 national team when Korea made that incredible run to the semifinals. Um, so he's a name to keep an eye on. The problem is he is still managing Ulsan. The other two to three candidates are out of work, but they are very, very subpar. They don't meet the standards that at least I have for the Korean national team. Um, I think the KFA favors domestic, but I hope that with enough fan pressure, with enough uh, pressure from within the the association as well, because there are still good people in the association. Mm -hmm. I hope that they lean towards either a better uh, domestic coach or hopefully a foreign manager. And when you say foreign manager, are you think it's somebody like Peter Segert? Because I've seen his name floated around quite a bit after he decided to not renew with Tajikistan. Is that is he at the top of your list or you want somebody else? He, he, he isn't. I think he's an intriguing name. Um, I just don't know enough about him to have a definite opinion of, oh, I love him, or I don't think that he's a, a good candidate for our national team. I've, I think his work with Tajikistan is incredible. Yeah. And everywhere he's gone, he's had quite a bit of success, even if it's a lower team. And his, his charisma, his ability to create uh, you know, a family – environment in the in the in whatever nation he plays for i think that's incredibly important especially for our um, team right now because i don't know if you saw there's there's beef in the korean national team ping right pong now. gate ping pong gate, you know <laughs> whether it's igangin and sunny fighting or sunny had a bit of a controversy with kim min jae there's apparently a divide amongst the age groups there's a divide amongst the european based players and the domestic players it's a mess right now and we do definitely need a figure a charismatic figure who's well respected and will set rules and organization in the um the national team and i think that peter sergert is is that could be that guy but i just don't know enough in terms of his football 
um, his football philosophy and whether mm -hmm. he's enough in that sense uh, to say yes or no to that name. Yeah, I think it would be a very interesting, very high risk, high reward appointment. But to be mm -hmm. honest, I feel like most of the appointments you guys have are would be pretty risky. Like it'd be a big job for Segert. But the way that he had Tajikistan playing, like I don't know how many of their games you saw at the Asian Cup, but if if you played that brand of football with just players who are a little better, you I mean, you're looking at something really special there. So mm -hmm. I, I understand the clamor for that hiring based on how he performed and based on the complete lack of creativity that Korea had under Klinsman. I mean, getting zero shots. Was it Australia zero shots in the first half or Jordan zero shots in the first half? I mean, I think it was three zero against... shots in the first half against Australia and yeah. zero in the whole game against Jordan. Just unbelievable stats for a team that going into the Asian Cup, everybody was like, yeah, you know, the Korean attack, that world class, they're good. I mean, the back line, we'll see. And then you guys can't even get shots off. It's so maybe, maybe a guy with that kind of, uh, you know, play the beautiful game the way it's meant to be played type philosophy. I think that could be, you know, uh, a potential shot there. Just, I just want to throw it out there because my boy, Pak Hang So, anybody claim, uh, clamoring for him to get in here after what he did with uh, Vietnam? So there are whispers of Pak Hang So, but only as an interim manager, mm. just because I think he would be very well respected. Again, he would be able to set the tone for the team, kind of get us back to at least baseline and then have the new manager build from there. But in terms of a like a permanent manager, um, definitely not. I think they're hopefully I want them to look younger than Pak Hang-seo. Yeah, he would be he would be that kind of grandfather figure, though. You know, he walks in the room. I feel, I feel like you pay attention. You respect that man, you know. Um, yeah, pop apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe he comes in just six weeks. You know, you give him like one international window. He just resets the ground rules and then he bounces out. And yeah, you get in a more permanent uh, uh, appointment there. All right. So let's say we have a pie of blame. So a sad pie for what went mm -hmm. uh, horribly wrong for Korea at the Asian Cup. What percentage of this pie are you giving to Jurgen Klinsmann? What percentage of the pie are you giving to the KFA? And what percentage of the pie are you giving to the players? Uh, seventy-five percent KFA, twenty mm. percent Jurgen Klinsmann, and then five percent the players. Um, just to start off with the KFA, the fact that they hired Jurgen Klinsmann, we we knew all the red flags that were there. Um, even when he had success again in Germany, Yogi Lev was the assistant manager. Um, he had minimal sex, success in the uh, US MNT. Like you would uh, be more of an expert, Jack, than I, than I am. But you know, then he was horrible in Bayern. Philip Long famously in his autobiography <laughs> said, "We only did fitness sessions. Within eight weeks, we knew that he would not be the manager of Bayern Munich um, in Hertha Berlin." He resigned in a Facebook Live. There were so many red flags there. And the fact that the KFA hired this man, I think they are fully, like at least 70%, 75% to blame. Um, the fact that they, like, again, like I said, we our players didn't touch a ball for two to three weeks leading up to the Asian Cup. That's what That alone is, is ridiculous. Yeah. And then even after this Asian Cup, you see what they're doing. It's This is an official. But I'm like 99.9% .9 sure they leaked ping pong gate, the the sun <laughs> and I mean beef to the sun. The sun had the first scoop of that, yeah. So that they could deflect blame from themselves, and they basically like I've said this in our channel before. They sold their players to the wolves so that they could you know get less attention from the Korean media. Um, Chung Mongyu, who unilaterally hired Klinsman, we had a we had a 62 man shortlist for the manager that various analysts and experts in, in Korea created. We shortened it down to 23. And then at the end of the process, Chung Mong-gyu comes in, he hires Jurgen Klinsmann, and he tells the technical committee 30 minutes before the hire that this is the man who's going to lead the Korean national team. That was what happened. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Was he at least on the 23-man list? That That's unknown as well. We don't know. Damn, so he, may, he maybe didn't even make the short list. And he said, this he might is our not. Guy. because the, if you guys, if you, the three criteria that the KFA put out there to the experts and the analysis, when they were looking for a new manager to succeed Paolo Bento was 
preferably a young manager, um, one that can build upon the attacking philosophies of Palo Bento, and one that is a tactician and is um, at least familiar with um, the data analysis that's been so prevalent in the modern game today. Klinsman's old. He's certainly not able to build upon the uh, build-up philosophy of Palo Bento, and he does. He doesn't believe in data, so he he, he doesn't. He he probably didn't even make the sixty-two man shortlist. He failed every criteria. Yeah, he failed every criteria, and I think that that's why I say seventy-five percent of the blame is on hiring this man, because Klinsman, he just he didn't change. You know, expecting him to change is, I think, unfair. we he's been the same man since he was the manager of the German national team in 2006. Yeah. He's arrogant, he's set on his own ways, and he believes that it's okay to be an ESPN analyst and live in California 90% of the time while being the man manager of another national team. Like, that's just the type of person he is. And it's hard to say, oh, that's Klinsman's fault. It's I think it's a systemic problem. You have to go deeper than that. Who hired Klinsman? Right. Who ignored all these red flags and hired Klinsman? That's why I say 75% of it is on the KFA. 20, 20 to 25, 20% on Klinsman, 5% on the players. Like that ping pong gate, it started like you're, you shouldn't be fighting over ping pong in the first place. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, it is the players on the field who are playing football. So it's hard to say they have zero say in it. There were players there that were absolutely atrocious that tournament. So a very minor portion to, to the players as well. Just real quick, you think if Palo Bento was the manager of Korea, you guys would win the Asian Cup? Or you would have won? It's hard to say it's hard to say we would have won, but I think that we would have had we would have gone to the finals and we would have had a much, much better chance. Okay. I think that's fair. I do want to touch on the KFA briefly this this is probably the part of the story the saga that i'm the least familiar with i mean you've talked about the president uh chum gung yu does anybody like this guy how long has he been in power why how did he get this position is his like tenure expiring soon like what what do we do about this man so he got the position this is his third um term as the kfa president before chung mong yu it was chung mong jun who is the who's a relative, I think, uncle of Chong Mong Yu, but um, they're part of the Hyundai group. Oh, it's like the they're a conglomerate. Stuff. Okay, they're the Chebol stuff. It's the conglomerate Damn. that okay. somehow got a hold of Korean football. Wow, and they use it as a business. They use it, you know, strictly in terms of promoting their brand. Um, Chong Mong Jun, to be fair, was a better president than Chong Mong Yu. He actually was the vice president of fifa i believe like he got up there he did a lot of good work for for korean football chong mong gyu's been an utter calamity um we got palo bento only because chong mong gyu was happy to leave the football decisions to uh hong myung bo who like i mentioned before in the video he was he's a candidate to replace um klinsman and hong myung bo kind of took charge of everything related to football he was part of the he hired the technical committee that ended up hiring uh, Paolo Bento. So when he's away from the football side, he only focuses on the business, you know, providing money, etc. He's fine. But when he starts to bring in his personal opinions and starts to implement his power, like the Klinsman hire, overriding every single person in the association, that's when there's a big problem. And his term is actually set to end in uh, January of 2025, I believe. And in the press conference yesterday of him announcing Klinsman's firing, uh, a reporter asked him, are you going to take responsibility and resign from your position? And he said the most confusing non-committal answer <laughs> that I think I've ever heard of. He's, he's a typical businessman. Mm. He evades, you know, criticism so well without saying, you know, anything of substance. Um, and right now, honestly, maybe other than the president, like the actual president of Korea, he's might be the most disliked figure in the nation. Wow. I would say that. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, he probably started reciting some like Korean 
parable or something when the reporter asked him that. <laughs> they had like nothing to do with you know his actual future um <laughs> dang okay that's man whenever the federations are corrupt like that it's it's such a sticky fix and it just it really sucks it's like a it's like a leech you know that just like constantly mm -hmm. like sucks the blood out of any good thing that's going on with the national team and it, it really can halt any progress whatsoever so i mean i, I guess i just hope for y'all's sake that I guess he doesn't run again in 2025 and he, he's done and somebody else comes in, but we will see with the Chebul stuff, bro. You never know. Honestly, we need like a Netflix. This could be a Netflix series, like a Korean Netflix it could series be. about managing Absolutely. being the president of the KFA mm -hmm. and associated with uh, Kanye at the same time. So I want to transition to the players though for a little bit. I feel from, uh, you know, as an outsider, I've always heard that most Koreans feel like Son underperforms generally with the national team as opposed to how he plays for Tottenham and I think it's fair to say at the 2023 Asian Cup at least he was a little disappointing why do you think he struggled like he did in this tournament was it all Klinsman was it all the formation what would you say I think it not only Klinsman but the the managers before him and Bentu was actually quite good at utilizing Sonny they didn't know his best position in the national team. Uh, we tried him out as a left winger, a right winger. When we played a 4-4-2 under Shin tae who's now the manager of Indonesia, he played as a second striker in the 4-4-2. Uh, Klinsman played him as the number 10, which is an absolute appalling decision. <laughs> um, but yeah, in Tottenham, he had, who no matter who the manager was, they got the best out of Son Min. And that was playing him as the rapid winger or striker, getting in behind the defense, whether it's a high line. Um, he struggles against a low block. Um, and that's why I think you see him struggle in Asia because a lot of the teams against Korea play, you know, a 5-4-1, a 4-5-1, whatever, and it's super low. And that's just where sunny strengths aren't dribbling past two to three guys. You need to use his speed, his ability to carve out those runs and mm -hmm. avoid the offside. And... You know, that in Tottenham, the, the managers, whether it was Jose Mourinho, who used Kane as the number 10 to feed Son, or now you see Ange Postacoglu, who sees who's, who's use, utilizing Son really well, they get the best out of his strengths. But in the Korean national team, no matter the, no matter the manager, um, there was always the question of how are we going to utilize our best player when he's going to be man marked by two to three, two to three of the, the opposing defense. And I think Paolo Bento did that quite well because he stuck him on the left wing and used him more as bait to create space for other players. Um, but Jurgen Klinsmann used him as the number 10. And that is maybe the worst position to use him, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like he struggled under Antonio Conte um, a year ago, a couple of years ago, because he was playing as a, the number 10 or the left attacking midfielder. But he was really central and he's not good in those roles. You want Sonny to get the least amount of touches as possible. For me, at least. Because he's not a good dribbly technical player. Um, and Klinsman thought that that was the best idea. Um, in terms of strictly the Asian Cup tournament, I think, yeah, Klinsman's tactics played a significant role. Um, not only the, the role that Son was asked to play, but there was just no organization at all in the final third like if you watched korea play there'd be five players in like one left half space and the whole right side would be the right back and or it's clear that two or three people are going to be man marking igangin two to three people are going to be attacking sun and there was no predetermined set patterns of play to either shift it out to the other side where there is space or get it to a more creative central midfielder and create those triangles, those one twos to get out of those sticky situations. Um, and I think one other factor is there's so much psychological pressure on Son. I think he knows that it was his last Asian cup. He might get another one in, in 2020, uh, what is it? 6, 27, 27, Saudi Arabia. Um, well, yeah. well, when he's, when he's 35, but in his prime, this is his last Asian cup. Korea hadn't won the Asian Cup in 64 years. 
every single person in Korea was calling this the golden generation. And he's the captain of the national team. I think there's so much, like so much. You could see it during the games too, where he was stressed and he looked anxious. And it doesn't help that there were no tactics. So it's a, so many factors that come into play. Um, but I would argue that despite the, you know, his general play being quite poor, he showed up in the big moments. You know, he Definitely. won the penalty against Australia. He scored the big free kick against Australia. Um, he didn't miss a single penalty in the Asian Cup, um, which is honestly, I think, really important. So he showed up in moments. But I agree with you, Jack. He, he definitely had a more disappointing tournament when you consider the high expectations that we have for him. Yeah, I definitely would f push back on anybody who would say Son was awful. He definitely wasn't awful. He wasn't terrible. But I think you highlighted two really big differences between like the, the, the mental state of being Tottenham versus Korea and also the play style Tottenham versus Korea. Like Again, like you said, Korea... Unless you're playing Japan or Iran or something like that, you guys have the ball, and it is a low block, and you got to break it down. With Spurs, I'm, I don't know. I'm a Spurs fan. I don't know if you knew that, but you know, at best, we're like the fifth best team in the Prem, right? Probably six. So that's quite a few games every season where we're the team that is counterattacking, and and oftentimes we've had managers who the entire game plan was to counterattack and sit back and. That space in behind definitely is where Sonny becomes like truly unplayable. And I don't think he got, man, I don't know how many opportunities he got this entire Asian Cup to do that. Like uh, maybe one or two instances come to mind against Saudi Arabia in the first half where mm -hmm. they kind of had a mid line. Like it wasn't even that high. And yeah, I, I can't remember if it was uh, Kim Taekwon or somebody played the ball over a few times. But yeah, it's just a different, it's a totally different style of football when he plays for Korea and. I think people who don't watch both teams closely might might get confused by that because I think they'll check the stats. They'll see like, oh, he only scores X amount of goals for Korea. You know, what's going on? Is he really not that good? Not knowing that, you know, the context, it is a different style of ball that he's being asked to play. Yeah. Do you think there's any Korean players who after the Asian Cup, their stock has gone up? They look better now. They have a better reputation. They're going to get a big move. Dortmund's on the phone right now with their agent saying, hey, we got to get this guy. 25 mil, that's nothing. We'll, we'll pay that right now. Straight cash. Um, there's one name that comes to my mind. It's our right back, left back. He started off the tournament as a right back. He ended as a left back. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, he plays for Ulsan Hyundai right now. Uh, I know we got offers from Fenerbahce before this tournament, maybe a year or so ago. And then he was heavily getting interest from I can't pronounce the Serbian name, but Red Star Belgrade, uh, where his teammate, uh, national international teammate Hwang Yimong plays, and they were pushing hard for him. The only unfortunate thing is Hong Myungbo. We've mentioned it a couple of times before already in, in this video. Um, he's the manager of Ulsan Hyundai, where he plays domestically, and he doesn't want uh, Seo Ryong to move abroad because he wants. He knows that Chumbuk are coming up. He knows that FC Seoul just signed Jesse Lingard. He's probably you know, wanting to keep his best players. I think he's the one young player in that tournament that played consistently and played well throughout the tournament. Um, his stock definitely went up. Um, actually, we saw West Ham scouting in at one point during the tournament. But unfortunately, due to his manager wanting him to stay one more season in Korea, I don't think that we'll see him move, make a big move yet. Dang. I know you were personally very excited at that Fenerbahce possibility i was 100 <laughs> i'm sure you had multiple tweets spam in the timeline uh when that dude spoke uh, yes sir dude i would agree with you so young woo he might be the these are obviously subjective questions but he might actually be the only correct answer i think like i, mean, I think egong in had a very good group stage and then he kind of tapered off a little bit but at least me personally and anybody who actually knows who egong in is watched him at mallorca like it's not like he was a surprise. Like, I expected him to be a baller, and, and yes. he was a baller. Uh, mm -hmm. Kim and Jay, a couple like really uncharacteristic mistakes, but I mean his distribution is is so essential to how you guys want to play. Uh, but again, yeah. not a surprise. So I'm about the best defender in Serie A. Not a surprise. Son top goal scorer in the Prem. Not a surprise. Wanky Chan, 
I mean, he missed he missed quite a few games um, and didn't really look like himself. So I definitely wouldn't say he looks better. And then a lot of the other players, man. Okay, who who had the biggest fall off? Whose stock is down eighty percent after the Asian Cup for Korea? For for Korean fans, yeah, Cho Bi Sung, who was our striker. Mm. He like he had a crazy ascent in the uh, twenty two World Cup um, when he scored those two headers against Ghana. Like it was the first time any Korean player has scored uh, more than one goal in the, at the World Cup. And, you know, he got a lot of popularity for his good looks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the big move to Denmark. He was playing really well for his for his Danish team. They're actually top of the table right now. Um, albeit some of the goals were a lot of penalty kicks, but still he was on form. But just at the Asian Cup, he was a totally different player. He seemed to lose all confidence. Even aerially, the thing that he is good at, it disappeared. Um, with his feet, he was abysmal. Like the, There was no link-up play. Whenever he got the ball, he gave it away. Um, he looked lost in terms of his positioning as well. And I guess that comes down to, again, Jurgen Klinsmann. But a lot of Korean fans had high hopes for him. And they were like, whoa, did we overrate this guy? Because he had a couple of good games at the World Cup. And his stock, at least in terms of Korean fans' minds, have, has gone really down. What would you say? Would you say he was overrated or or what, based on his World Cup performance? I would say he was overrated because even before coming into this tournament, before we saw his terrible performances, I always rated his backup, Wu Yong yu as the more complete um, forward. Like, at the World Cup, Bentu got the best out of him, and that was Lee Gang-in whipping in crosses his quality, with his quality left foot. And Cho Gi-sung using his good aerial ability, his good positioning inside the box to act as a poacher and score those, you know, really highlight worthy goals. But if you saw him, you know, in his K-League days when he was first playing for Anyang and then when he made the move to Chumbuk, he was never particularly great with his, you know, with his feet. He wasn't, you know, the most awful player, like, but he wasn't, uh, it wasn't technically, uh, how do you say it? fine-tuned or it wasn't you know wasn't pretty to see he did his job he passed it out to he held up play um, but he was never the most technical player and i think that there are limits to these types of players who get on with physicality and work rate and we saw we just saw those brutally exposed in qatar when he didn't have the system to get his you know strengths in play who's better chogusung or kim shin <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. I had to ask. I have to ask. Okay, it's a cult, he's a cult that hero. Was a, that was a valid, <laughs> valid question. Against Asian teams, honestly, Kim shin -Hook? Wow. Um, <laughs> Let us know in the comments. But, <laughs> but I think that I st still think that there is a player there in Cho Song. He's still still young. He's still learning in the Danish league. Potential-wise, 100% Cho Gi Song. The one player that I want to ask you about before we get to our closing thoughts here, Huang and Bum. I, I don't know if you've talked to Albert about him, but Albert mm. uh, is very much on the he is overrated, he is overloved side, mm. and I tend to agree with him roughly. Mm. But but I also want to ask you if you think that it was more the system that was kind of mm. leaving him exposed, or do you generally just think he he just maybe isn't that good? Mm. Yeah. So. Albert and I have had many conversations about. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> um, I'm personally in the camp where he's a good player. Is he overrated? Perhaps. But is he also our best player in that position? I would say also yes. Um, certainly, he had a poor tournament. He made a lot of mistakes. He looked incredibly tired. He was not his usual self. But... What, what other midfielder plays as the sole defensive midfielder against Manchester City in the Champions League and puts a, puts a performance in? You know, he was a pivotal member in 2018 when we won the Asian Games, and that was the tournament where Sonny, Kim Min-jae, Hwang Yi-chan, all those guys won military exemption. He was the key player. Um, Paolo Bento, he was his most trusted midfielder. So yes, it's. I think both two things can be true at the same time. I think that yes, he is 
overrated just simply because he is our best midfielder. But also, like you said, the system didn't help them at all. Um, we had no build-up structure at all. No. What, what happened was, and I analyzed this with a lot of photos and videos, clips in one of our videos, um, Hwang Inbom was asked to pick up the ball from Kim min -jae. He was immediately surrounded by at least two or three Malaysian players. He was asked to beat the press, carry the ball up 20 to 30 yards, and then find someone in the front four. That works maybe if you're a Rodri five times out of 10. And how many Rodri's are there in this world? And Hwang Inbom was asked to do that. And you saw him get brutally exposed. And that's when, you know, he made those mistakes. And also, I think the, fat the fatigue factor you can't ignore as well. He played basically full time for the first two group stages. For some reason, we played our, we played full strength against Malaysia in our third match when that match did not matter at all. That went, ended up being a hundred minute game. He played basically 100 minutes against Saudi Arabia, 100 minutes against Australia, and then Jordan. No player is going to be able to survive that with that type of mileage. It leads to, obviously, physical, um, physical, mental, and emotional fatigue. And that's when the mistakes start to creep in, no matter how good of a player you are, no matter how much you focus on the game. When your legs aren't moving, what are you going to do? So yes, I agree. Definitely. Is he overrated? A little bit. Is he our best midfielder? Yes. Did the system fail him? Yes. Those would be my answers. You and I are in complete agreement in the sense that I don't know what the alternative is. I, I do think there's a player there, but mm -hmm. I do think he was kind of put on an island and asked to do a lot. And he just, he just not that guy, but there's, there's not many players to what you alluded to, who are that guy, who can do what he's being asked to do under Klinsman. Exactly. You guys in the comments, let us know what you think about Huang Bomb because I know he's very polarizing. To wrap up here, making it to the semifinal of the Asian Cup, Jurgen Klinsman is out the door. There's leaks coming out, ping pong battles. It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> How does all of this affect the mission going forward for 2026? Does it affect the the objective for that tournament, the goals, the preparation, what would you say? Has anything changed from all this? I think public perception is the most important thing that's changed. Um, before we were glossing over the, the shortcomings, the incompetence, dare I say corruption of our football association. It was being hidden by the individual talents and success of guys like Sunny, Yi Gang Yin, Kim Min Jae, um, it's really sad because we're in a golden generation, but also in terms of the popularity of football and Korea right now, it's at an all time high. We just had Jesse Lingard come to the K league. The K league interest is at an all time high. And then we get hit with this horrible tournament. The scandals that are coming out, uh, from the player camp, the incompetency that's been exposed from the KFA side. Um, I'm glad that it's happening right now. I still think that it's not too late to fix our problems and get back on the the right track. But a lot has to change, Jack, if, for us to find any sort of success in 2026. Firstly, this is an absolute must. Somehow, Chong Mong, we have to get Chong Mong-gyu out of the KFA. No other football federation that's well-functioning has a guy that knows nothing about football at the head of its organization. So he has to go out. That's a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. To replace him has to be someone who not only is incredibly knowledgeable about our the, about the game of football, but also has a genuine passion and love for Korean football. They're willing to spend the hard out, the, the long hours, put in the hard work to put in, to implement a system that's transparent, that's based on, you know, logic, that's based on the fundamentals that have been developed in modern football right now. Um, and that goes in the youth levels, U21, U23, the national team, everything. Everything needs an overall. Um, we need to get better people in place. And that's 
we need to get it in place fast because we need the right manager to lead this dysfunctional, disorganized national team. I said, I, I recorded a video just before hopping on to, to this, this one. And it was, I frankly don't care who the next, the name of our next national team manager. I am ready to 100% back whoever is chosen. If the process of selecting that manager is logical and transparent, and in the introductory press conference, they explain, we selected this manager for reason A, reason B, and reason C. If everything makes sense, they could hire, they could hire you, Jack. They could hire Albert. They could hire anyone. Maybe they if should. It makes sense to me. Maybe they should. 100% you'd be better than your conclusion. <laughs> and probably, uh, actually, would I be more expensive? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, if it just, I just want transparency. Not my, not just myself, everyone in Korea. We want transparency. We want things to make sense. And we want a football federation in place that doesn't sell out its players to the wolves, but protects its players, that cares about its players, that creates an atmosphere where players feel proud to represent their country. They look forward to international matches. It's a welcome break from all the club football that's been going on. And that's sadly not the state of Korean football right now. There's a lot to work on, but call me an optimist whenever we are, whenever we are in trouble when the darkest times are here. That's when just Korean people as in general, that's when we get together and figure things out, but it, it can't happen with Chung as the president. So that is step number one for me. According to Jason, what are the expectations? What do you want to see from Korea 2026? He's thinking quarterfinal, semifinal, what will help you sleep well at night and say that the world cup was a success? For me, the results matter slightly less. It, I know that I've had this debate, debate with many of my friends, many of the experts, whoever. Some people say results, first and foremost, are the most important thing in football. For me, it's, I, I don't disagree with that. I think results, of course, are 100% important. But for me, it's the type of football that we play. I think the in 2022, when Paolo Bento was the manager, so many people in Korea were inspired and touched because not because we made it to the round of 16, but because we were able to play our brand of football, a football that we have never tried at an international stage like the World Cup. Attacking football, we controlled teams, we attacked teams based on our imperative. That's the football that I want to see. I want us to see have us have a clear philosophy, really attack teams, and if I enjoy watching the football that we play, if we don't make it past the group stages, that's okay to me. Maybe it's slightly controversial, but I would rather be proud of the way we play and get knocked out in the group stages than see this atrocity that's an excuse of football and then make it to the semi semifinals of the Asian Cup. That's personally my opinion. Of course, it'd be great if we made the round of 16, the quarterfinals. I would love that. But first and foremost, Let's get back to finding our identity, mm -hmm. finding what football we want to play, and then use that as a base to go on a run. Because the the teams that have success in World Cups was Mar it was Morocco in twenty twenty two. They have a set style of play, and they believe in it. So that's what I want to see in twenty twenty six. Jason, where can people find you online? Yeah, so mostly uh, a lot of my stuff is on Twitter um, at Jason's underscore Jzub. Um, as Jack mentioned bef before, um, Albert and I, we just recently started a YouTube channel called Bibin Ballers. Uh, do a lot of uh, fun work there covering the Korean national team and Asian football. Uh, just a newbie channel, so make sure to come check us out. Um, before we end off, Jack, just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. It was a great time. Um, so frustrating topics, but it's an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to vent, to vent my frustration. And um, yeah, I hope we can do this again. Absolutely, dude. That's Deadball TV is here to be cathartic. That's what I want uh, from the guests to, to, to walk away feeling a, a burden lifted off their shoulders because yeah. they've, they've said what needs to be said. Um, and I really appreciate appreciate you also coming on, man. I had a, had a great time as well. I will put the link to 
your personal socials and beaming ballers in the description of this video guys we're going to end the video there if you enjoyed make sure you leave a like and hit subscribe so you don't miss any future asian footy uploads here on dead ball tv if you're listening on streaming platforms please give please give the podcast a five-star rating we appreciate you guys for watching or listening and we'll see y'all in the next one